Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Greetings. I'm Dr. Robert Lee Kilpatrick, the chair of the Health and Medicine member-led forum here at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco. You know, since uh, the pandemic began a year ago, we transitioned to 100% digital programming, which of course has allowed us to bring in speakers from different places. So today, as part of our Healthy Society series, we have a program which will be focused on the rise of family caregivers of the elderly. And we have a dynamic group of speakers today who are experts and know all about this topic, which is of interest to all of us. I'll quickly introduce them and then hand it over to our moderator. Today we have a Dr. Uh, Teresa Terry Harvath, PhD, and she's a professor and senior director for strategic initiatives at the Family Caregiving Institute, the Betty Moore, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at the University of California, Davis. Hello, Terry. We also have Dr. Susan C. Reinhard, PhD, who is a senior vice president and director of the AARP Public Policy Institute. She's the chief strategist for the Center to Champion Nursing in America and Family Caregiving initiatives, and I believe you're in Washington, D.C. Greetings, Susan. And finally, our moderator today is Jonathan Davis, who's the founder and CEO of Trualta, which is a young company that is helping caregivers to be more effective in their work. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the baton over to you, Jonathan, and I'll come back near the end of the program. Okay? Bye for now. Thank you very much, Robert, for that warm introduction. I'm excited to be moderating the conversation today with Terry and Susan, two influential leaders in the family caregiving space. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Jonathan Davis, and as Robbie said, I'm the founder and CEO of Tralta. We are a tech-enabled education and support platform for families that are managing care at home for their aging loved ones. We partner with healthcare providers, insurers, and social service organizations to help families build skills and find support when caring for an aging loved one. Uh, with the insight of these two fantastic speakers, we're going to have a practical and candid discussion about how families are managing care for our aging population. Please feel free to ask questions in the YouTube chat, and we'll address them during our conversation. Uh, I'll start by passing it over to Terry and then Susan for introductions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I'm Terry Harvath. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and have been a nurse in gerontology for 40 years. I am currently uh, both uh, teaching and also seeing patients clinically in our new Healthy Aging Clinic. And with that, I'm seeing family caregivers and trying to help support them in the role of caring for an older family member. Susan. Hello, everybody. Uh, Susan Reinhardt. And I guess I would say I'm a visiting nurse by background. That's really what brought me into the world of family caregiving, visiting people in their homes and realizing that I was just going to come and go. Ding dong. Like maybe I'd be there an hour, maybe. But the family caregiver is the one who's really doing everything. And so my life is as an educator, a researcher, a policymaker, and now I lead the think tank for AARP, uh, has always been um, focused on care of older people and really what can we do to support those who help them. Excellent. Uh, well, you know, I thought we could dive in by just, you know, uh, emphasizing that this panel here, we know that more than anyone, that this isn't new. Family caregiving has been sort of an important issue for a long time, but we've definitely seen sort of a recent kind of uptick in, in attention and discussion around this important topic. Uh, maybe uh, just starting with Terry, we can discuss what's changed that sort of resulted more recently in a renewed focus on the family caregiver. Yeah, Jonathan, you know, we've known for a long time, for decades, that the baby boomers were going to 
really changed the world when they started aging, um, 10,000 a day for, you know, 30, 40 years. And the, I think what has happened is that they have forced a tipping point in our healthcare system, particularly in long-term care, because we are now reaching the point where we cannot afford to pay for the care that those who are aging are going to need through the rest of their lives. And we have always been reliant on families to provide that care, but now more than ever, we need to support families in that care so that they can provide the care they want to and that we can alleviate the stress that that would otherwise put on our healthcare system. I think these issues have also been um, really highlighted through the pandemic. And I think that has also increased our attention on family caregivers because um, when everything shut down across the country, what we saw was that many family caregivers were left on their own uh, to try and manage uh, complex care for an older family member. And so it's really been a call to action uh, that has been coming, but now has gotten a lot more attention. So I, uh, I would add that, you know, Wow, I think it was in the 80s, I was taking courses in sociology and writing about family caregivers, and it was just becoming into the literature then. Um, and I remember Elaine Brody saying that it was going to be normative. That's a sociological term, which means everybody, <laughs> that this was going to take attention. And so it has been over the years getting more attention in research and but but now it really is. Uh, Rosalind Car Carter would say, you know, you're either going to be a caregiver or you're going to need a caregiver, right? So, uh, as people have been aging and as people with disabilities have lived longer, so it isn't only care of older people. We are focusing on that now, but it's care of, of children with special needs, for example. So it has become uh, quite normative, as they say. Uh, and I also think that policymakers, if we get more to that. Are, are experiencing it. They are themselves family caregivers or they, their wife is or their husband is, like they're seeing it more. So it's not as mysterious. It's not as niche. It really yeah. is something that people are, they, they don't call it family caregiving, by the way. This isn't something that, you, you know, you're a wife, a mother, a sister, a brother, you're not a family caregiving, but we call it that so we can study it and do some work around it. And I just want to add that uh, ARP has been looking at this for quite some time, the Public Policy Institute, and we have computed that it's $470 billion of free care basically. So to Terry's point, we can't afford this. We can't, we need family caregivers to, as Carol Levine would say, stay on the job. And if we're asking them to do that, we really have to do more to help them do that. Yeah, I, that's a great point. And I think, yeah, the ARP has been working on it a long time as, as policymakers, researchers, and, you know, even I think that with uh, innovators, new startups, you know, is another kind of indicator that, hey, it's kind of crossing that precipice from being a nice to have to a need to have. And there's a real sort of uh, imperative to innovate, to help family caregivers, which I think is another good indicator. And, you know, something that uh, another sort of indicator to me that it's sort of hitting mainstream is that it's starting to become part of the employer conversation. And I think because so many, at least 60%, I think, on the latest data of caregivers are employed full time. So um, I, I think these employee assistance programs, uh, mental health broadly, you know, really addressed during the pandemic. But then when you look at specific drivers within that and specific programs that are supporting employees, caregiving is kind of starting to rise to the surface. Um, maybe just uh, any kind of comments on innovative programs you've seen uh, from an employer standpoint. Sure. Actually, we have done some surveys of this and um, for quite some time. When I was deputy commissioner back in the 90s, I was trying to get employers engaged and, and point that out. Uh, it was not an easy lift then, I have to say, but it is getting more attention. Uh, partly, as I said, it's normative, but also because we have shown through our studies that one in four caregivers is a millennial. And that was shocking when we started putting that out. And the truth is, is not news? That's been true for quite some time. We just put it out there. Well, they are the younger people in the workplace. You know, now we have Gen Zs 
that are family caregivers. So, you know, we used to talk about the average family caregiver as a woman in her late 40s caring for her mother, by the way, white, caring for a white mother. And so that average, um, which is still true, just belies the millions and millions, over 40 million family caregivers that are, they come in all ages, shapes, sizes, everything. Um, and so this focus on millennial caregivers has helped get, get the attention of uh, employers in particular, because they really, really want to recruit and retain, we hold people of all ages, but definitely um, a younger population too. Yeah, I would um, echo that, Susan, that pre-pandemic, we already had a lot of research that demonstrated that caregiving can interfere with employment. Um, taking time off to take uh, an aging parent to uh, medical appointments or fielding phone calls from in-home caregivers when issues come up. And then when the pandemic hit and everyone was doing that from home, it became even more obvious because now those, uh, in particular millennial caregivers who may also have children now who are being schooled from home are really squeezed in the middle and feeling like they are trying to take care of aging parents. They are also trying to manage a household, their job and their children and their children's education. And I think that has also helped employers realize that perhaps part of what they need to start doing is supporting families in caregiving in the same way that they, you know, sort of recognized as women came into the workforce that childcare were was going to be something that they needed to pay attention to. And we're starting to see employers recognizing and um, wanting to provide benefits for their employees to help offset some of the strains that they experience in trying to manage all of the many demands on their time. I just want, I think that's really important, the flexibility. So that's number one. And now we all have flexibility. Well, not everybody, but those who are able to work from their homes. Um, and now what we've been working on, sometimes through legislation, advocacy, often at the state level, is sick leave. So can you, you if you're fortunate enough to have sick leave, can you use it? to take care, to take your mother to the doctor, for example, take, you know, that, can you use it? And not everybody allows that. Employers have not typically allowed that. That is changing. Then there's paid family leave. We're starting to see more of that. Uh, and, um, and benefits like ARP has this, but we're not the only ones. Caregiving leave. Like actually we get two weeks of caregiving leave that you can take throughout the year. Now that may not be enough, but it is really, really important uh, to have. So I think that'll be the, the uh, up and coming one that you'll see. Excellent. Yeah, and it, it has been great to see, even in the past couple of years, those employers really uh, start to uh, recognize and uh, provide accommodations like you mentioned, Susan and Terry. Um, if we step back and, and more broadly, look at sort of the the tools, the support, what's out there for all family caregivers, employed or otherwise. Uh, and to the audience, we encourage you to, to pop questions into the chat. Um, you know, I look at the AARP, there's 20 million family caregivers performing medical and nursing tasks, according to the, the fantastic research going on there. And they're doing so with very little guidance. So uh, these are intense, time-consuming, sometimes very stressful caregiving situations. Um, and I know that your two organizations, the ARP and UC Davis, have collaborated in the past um, on the Home Alone Alliance tools specifically for caregivers managing complex care. And anyone in the audience can kind of Google Home Alone Alliance and find some resources there. Uh, I think, you know, all of us are trying hard to get these resources into more caregivers' hands. You know, what do we have to do to accomplish that? What are the, what are the barriers and, and how do we get these solutions into more caregivers' hands? So I'm really glad this is, of course, a passion. I told you I was a visiting nurse and I knew this was going on for years. You know, I'd go in and I had to teach them how to give an injection, you know, how to put a tube down somebody's nose. That When that happened the first time, I was like, are you kidding me? And I literally shook when I first did it. And I'm going to leave this retired teacher caring for his wife with um, Lou Gehrig's disease is what it was. I'm like, I cannot believe that he's supposed to have to do this. I gave him my home phone number to call me over the weekend because I was so worried about him. Um, 
And so, and that's going on. We even have intravenous medication at home and uh, peritoneal dialysis. I know these are big technical terms, but that's the point. They're big technical things. And so what can we do? So um, I, I did start that study, Home Alone, um, with some funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation. I really need to thank them for that funding. And um, wasn't a shock, but it was good to have data, like to actually say, this is what's happening. And it, it has become part of the uh, world right now that I live in, that people say medical nursing tasks or complex care, and they're paying attention to it. So we started by developing videos that we looked all over. There's got to be videos to teach people how to do things. But the videos that existed were um, how, did, how a nurse uh, faculty, how Terry would teach a student, for example, or how I used to teach. They were not, there was no caregiver in it, for one thing. There was never a caregiver in the picture. Right? And a very technical language and... And things like, this is going to be easy. Well, you know, it's not so easy. And don't make me think that I'm stupid if I don't think it's so easy. So we started by doing research on, well, what are the do's and don'ts in creating these videos? So this has been going on now for a number of years. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Heather Young, who is a colleague with Terry and I, started how are we going to do this? Then we joined forces more um, specifically, created the Home Alone Alliance of others that would join us. So we now have many, many. In fact, we're still doing them. We're now going to work a, a series on pain management. So we have many of them. We have so many that are in Spanish and we have um, tip sheets that are many different, that are in several different languages. And they're sitting on this no longer alone, ARP.org slash no longer alone website. We are starting to push them out. They are going to eventually be on YouTube. That's like taking a while to get going on all this. You know, you have to do all the legal stuff, the copywriting and all that kind of stuff. We have hospital systems that want to use them. Terry's got them on her website. Uh, there are many different websites, but this year we have a whole communications plan of how exactly we're going to be pushing them out. And ARP is going to take a much stronger role in doing that. I mean, we wanted to make sure they were good. We did evaluation research on them. How is this working? So, you know, we're pretty careful about it, but we're very confident now that they are a good series. Yeah, Harry? you know, yeah, you know, Susan, you alluded to, I think, one of the challenges in getting this information out in the hands of family caregivers is that many family caregivers don't identify themselves as caregivers. And the healthcare system also doesn't have routine ways of screening to determine who is or who has a family caregiver. Certainly the CARE Act that AARP has been instrumental in getting that legislation passed in most states um, across the country is helping that. But our, our systems are not set up. Um, you know, I'm seeing caregivers in our clinic and the first um, issue that we had to figure out was, well, whose chart does this information go in? If the caregiver is a patient of UC Davis, should it go in their chart so their providers know about it? And if they're not a, a, a patient, or even if they are, shouldn't this information about caregiving also go in the, the electronic health record of the older person? And, and we don't have mechanisms to easily connect the information about the caregiver with the older person. And so there are system changes that we need to make in order to, first of all, identify who is or has a family caregiver, and then do screening about how they're doing. Are they experiencing high levels of stress? Because there are some caregivers who are managing quite well. And, and we learn from those caregivers about strategies they've figured out through trial and error um, what to do. But we need to be able to identify those caregivers who are really struggling and who would most benefit from these sources, uh, uh, resources that we have. And if there are um, nurses or healthcare professionals who are in the audience, I would encourage you, if you work in a hospital and you're caring for older patients, one of the things that you need to do is to make sure that you include their family caregiver in your discharge planning and that you assess how well prepared they feel to manage what is likely complex care. 
you know, we've been seeing the trend of patients being discharged sicker and quicker from hospitals. That accelerated during the pandemic when we wanted to get older people out of places where we didn't want them, you know, possibly exposed to um, COVID-19. And so again, families were absorbing more complex care that they often received very little or on the fly training to perform. And so we need to do a better job of assessing how well prepared caregivers are. And hopefully what caregivers can do is to identify, self-identify and say, hey, you know, I'm a caregiver and I'm the person who's supposed to be doing this dressing change when my dad comes home and I don't know how to do it. Um, and so, you know, making them more visible is the first step in linking them then to the resources that may ease the burden. Definitely. That really resonates uh, with us in terms of the self-identifying as a caregiver, sort of raising your hand, I need resources. So many folks, and Susan alluded this at the beginning, you're just kind of looking after mom, dad, partner, other relative. It's kind of the normal course of life, but you don't realize there are great resources out there for you. Maybe you just need to know, hey, I'm a caregiver and start searching with that. Or maybe, you know, as you can go straight to that to that Home Alone No More and, and Home Alone Alliance on the ARP to find those practical videos. We're out there, uh, you know, when we're trying to deliver our, our training programs to family caregivers in partnership with state government, there's hundreds of thousands of caregivers in their state or county or, and it's so hard to get them to raise their hand. It's like almost what is the marketing message to say, hey, there are resources out there for you uh, to, to sort of help you provide care at home. And, and that, certainly, um, that, that certainly resonates with us. You know, I think, Jonathan, another challenge is, is just that there are resources out there. And when caregivers go to try and find them, it can be daunting. Um, and the curation of resources so that you know that you can trust this information, I think, is also part of the challenge. And through the Home Alone Alliance, that's another piece that we've been taking a look at. How can we ensure that the information that we're putting out there and that we're recommending um, to family caregivers is based on the best evidence available? And um, that can be difficult to find. There, you know, there are uh, resources that I, you know, I send caregivers to with great confidence, the Home Alone Alliance and our website, uh, but also uh, the Alzheimer's Association uh, website has a lot of really well curated, well reviewed information that is for people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias for their family caregivers, as well as for professionals. And so getting a hold of just a few places where you can trust that information, I think is, is also an important piece of um, decreasing the overwhelming feeling you can have when you, you know, do a Google search and you get you know, hundreds of thousands of hits that you have to sift through. I think Definitely. that's a really important point. ARP has been not just me. I mean, there's a whole lot of people at ARP working on caregiving. And we have a, a website, too. I gave the one specifically for the videos, but it's just ARP.org slash caregiving. And, it, you know, working with the Alzheimer's Association, it, not recreating, trying to put it in uh, some sense, because the issues, we're talking a lot about the medical kinds of things, but there's like legal issues and uh, paperwork that you should know where to put it and find it. Uh, there's how to take care of yourself. You know, what are some healthy uh, behaviors, meditation links? Again, this is not everything we create. It's there's the Family Caregiving Alliance. There's, there's lots of other groups that uh, have it. So it's just trying to link. <laughs> Here, here's where you can go. And I think yeah. what Terry said, so important, reliable, somebody else has looked at this, someone you trust, some organization you trust has gone through this. Very important. Yeah, I, certainly. And, and we find that not only does it have to sort of be evidence-based and reliable, but it has to be delivered in a way that a busy family member has time and can can consume. And so, you know, we, we have a question from the audience here asking how Trolta actually supports caregivers and uh, sort of to tie it into this conversation, the idea that a caregiver can find their way into their platform, a social worker, case manager, nurse offers them access to Trolta. They fill out a little bit of a questionnaire uh, just about what 
their care situation looks like and what their sources of distress are. And it's a very personalized, tailored, hey, here's the first three things you need to know. And uh, I think that, you know, when we think about how to get these resources to family caregivers, when they're so overwhelmed and you could Google and you can end up deep in YouTube and there's three hour videos and quick hits and all sorts of stuff to know that it's personalized for them, that like, Hey, this is, this is really specific to my care situation is where we see the most engagement. Great. And, you know, I think what, what your website has in common with what we've been trying to do with AARP is create bite size short, you know, I think our first uh, stab at videos were way too long. And, you know, now we aim for, you know, right around five to six minutes maximum. And it's, That can be a challenge to do, but it's with recognition that caregivers often don't have a lot of time uh, to invest and a three hour, even a 15 minute video may be too long for them with the window of time that they have available to invest in their own education. And so, um, you know, those resources that are um, able to be consumed in bite-sized pieces, I think, probably tend to work a little bit better for family caregivers. Definitely. I don't know, Terry, maybe you can give a, a just a specific example of what some of these videos might contain. You'd shared an uh, interesting anecdote with your brother uh, that, that you'd mentioned that just kind of to, to let the audience know specifically sort of what, what, what there is to learn. Yes. Um, I not only uh, work with caregivers, I have been a caregiver um, on several occasions. And a couple of years ago, uh, one of my family members was in hospice and my brother and I were there um, helping her and she needed to be helped on and off the commode um, because she couldn't transfer by herself. And you know, my brother and uh, my two nephews were just sort of muscling you know, uh, because they were big and strong, but I was worried that they were really going to hurt their backs because this is something we were doing multiple times a day. And so I said, you know, let me teach you how to do a one person pivot transfer and showed them how to do it. And my brother said, what do families do that don't have a nurse who can teach them this? And, you know, I, I think that's, the million dollar question, right? I mean, there are lots of nurses around, but not all nurses uh, take care of older adults or older adults with dementia. And so um, we have also developed resources for healthcare professionals so that they can work more effectively with family caregivers in teaching them some of these things. But we've got videos um, on different aspects of mobility, on managing urinary incontinence, incontinence on um, how you manage complex equipment in the home, nebulizers, oxygen, mechanical lifts. Um, We are just finishing up putting the finishing touches on a series of videos looking at how how can you manage a hospitalization and be involved in a way that helps you advocate and leave that hospitalization with the information that you need to provide care in the home. And so Um, With these videos, we've tended to focus on those things that Susan and I went to nursing school to learn how to do um, that most families, you know, really don't know how to do this. Some figure it out. Some have a nurse who can help them figure it out. And for the rest, we hope maybe they'll look at these videos and that they'll be helpful to them in, in figuring out how to do some of these things. That's great. Thanks. That's a, a concrete example. Um, hey, we have a question from the audience here just about the pandemic. So if we were to, to step back and look at, reflect on the past year and say, you know, I know we touched on it earlier, but maybe are there a, a, a few headlines from each of you about how the pandemic will change approaches to caregiving moving forward? Maybe we can start with you, Susan. Yeah, we just did a webinar yesterday on this, actually. Um, we have a whole series Uh, about this uh, aimed at professionals. And the first thing is understanding the value of a family caregiver, recognizing them, including them, as Terry said, include them in the team. What does that mean? Um, So she mentioned the CARE Act. It's the Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act that came out of this research from Home Alone and is now in, uh, as she said, most states. 
And that's a beginning because when someone is hospitalized by law, they must ask the person of any age, by the way, any diagnosis, is who's going to help you? Is there anyone that's going to be helping you? You know, not family care, anyone that's going to help you. And they use different things. And if the person says yes, then they are asked if they would like that person or person's names in the electronic health record. That's huge. That's like the first time this is a law that they have to put their name. So, you know, who you're supposed to be talking to. Right. And that automatically gives them the legal authority, the, the professionals, the legal authority to talk to, to people, because that's a whole issue of privacy. Right. And then if you if they are expected to do these more complex tasks or really anything, they must be offered instruction training. And then they're supposed to also then be notified as soon as they can when the person's going to be discharged. So you're ready. So that's a very simple, really, you hardly have to believe that should be a law, but it is. Now we're very happy to have that. And we're studying, again, how it's being implemented. Well, the pandemic, we were already doing that. Then the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, nurses will say, you know, I never realized how much the family caregivers do. Simple things like getting water, you know, get just reaching things, bringing things in that the person needs. It may not seem like a lot, but it is. And when nurses needed to start doing more of that, that was a lot to do. Then it was, well, you can't visit. Can we use electronics like an iPad, an iPhone, etc., to help visit? That became something certainly ARP lobbied at the state level quite a bit. The great hospitals were doing some of these things. Uh, there were funders that were giving money for equipment, you know, iPads, et cetera, to do that. Well, now, thank God, we are in a situation where you can visit again. But we also still need this electronic forms of communication because the person might, the caregiver might be working and can't come, might be a long distance caregiver. That's new. And that's not going to change that. I see that as a real positive of, of trying to bring somebody in. And then there's also, let's start talking to the family caregiver right from the beginning, include them in medical nursing rounds so they can hear from each other and understand what's going on. That's what we were talking about yesterday. So it's that's it used to be many healthcare professionals either ignored the family, might have even seen them as kind of annoying, like, oh, God, they're here, you know. I hate to say this, but it's true. Um, and um, they definitely weren't including them in rounds. It's like, well, they're just, they're just visitors. They're visitors. So we have a whole series not just visitors. That's the whole thrust of what we're saying. These are part of the team. In fact, the main team that's going to be helping somebody, including the patient, the person, by the way, needs to be part of this team. So I think that the pandemic has accelerated our efforts to make that happen. And there's a better consciousness of those who have experienced it, not just in hospitals, but in other settings. I don't know about you, Terry. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on your um, not just a visitor theme. Um, last year, around this time, when the pandemic hit, I actually was with my partner um, who had been hospitalized for cancer-related complications. And as things started shutting down and visitors were um, removed, you know, were banned from hospitals, I got kicked out of the hospital. And um, she was experiencing post-operative uh, delirium. She was confused. She had a tracheostomy, which meant that she couldn't speak to advocate for herself. And fortunately, I was able to sort of uh, claw my way back um, into uh, being with her during her hospitalization. And, and I think she would have died. Um, during that hospitalization had I not been with her because there were several times when her trach became occluded and I had to summon help for somebody to come in and get her suctioned. And um, she wasn't able to do that for herself. She couldn't figure out how to use the, the call light because she was so confused from um, the multiple surgeries that she'd had by that time. And, and during that time, 
many, many hospitals, if not most hospitals, when they banned visitors, they made exceptions for parents of minor children and partners of pregnant women, which are absolutely reasonable exceptions to make because we know that children do better when parents are with them during hospitalization. And I had my tonsils out when I was five and my mom wasn't allowed to stay with me. It was terrifying. But now we, we allow parents to stay with children, but we lump family caregivers to frail older adults and other adults into the category of visitor when they're not. And I think my hope is that coming out of the pandemic, we start to make a distinction that caregivers are not visitors. They're not there just to brighten the person's day and bring them flowers or a card. That when caregivers are there, particularly there for long hours during a hospitalization, it's because they know that the older person cannot advocate for themselves. They know that they have special needs. They have insider information about what this person looks like when they start to become confused. Um, they need to know how to do the things that are they're going to do when they go home. And so recognizing that caregivers are as essential to an older person's care in the hospital as parents uh, of minor children and partners of pregnant women, I think will go a long way to help older adults um, in general post-pandemic in hospitals so that we see them as part of this person's healthcare team, an essential part of the healthcare team, rather than as a visitor um, who's there to brighten their day. Certainly. I think from, uh, you know, as we develop our tool for family caregivers, one thing we've seen from the pandemic is, um, you know, social isolation among seniors and caregivers has always been an issue. And now it's it's next level isolation for all of us, but for these caregivers, and especially because we support a lot of families who are managing Alzheimer's or dementia at home. They're caring for a loved one sort of with cognitive decline. And, you know, we, we talked to some of these, you know, an, an older gentleman in our, who's a, who's a big user of our portal, who's caring for his wife and just kind of needs someone else to talk to. The, the best thing we can do for him is get him in touch with another caregiver who understands. And so our, like, the way we've shifted our innovation for supporting families during the pandemic is to go beyond building skills and providing support, beyond giving them this personalized kind of learning journey, but actually saying, hey, we have to connect you with one another because this social isolation is causing, you know, adverse health effects for you, but also uh, sort of just, just the, the, the health distress that, that is well beyond even pre-pandemic caregiving, which was already a major issue. And so, yeah, we've written we, the, the other piece where we're seeing this play out is when family caregivers are trying to get access to uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, um, where, again, they often are not seen as an essential part of the healthcare team for this older adult. And so while they're bringing the older adult in to get a vaccine, they may not be eligible to to get a vaccine themselves. And I've heard from so many family caregivers who have been so fearful. You know, it's my job to protect my mom or to protect my spouse. And, you know, I'm afraid that I'm going to be the one who brings COVID here. So that isolation, I think, was intensified by fears that caregivers had about whether they would be the the link to COVID for an aging family member. And, um, and I'm very pleased to say uh, at UC Davis, we've been successful in advocating for family caregivers to also get vaccinated when they bring an older family member in, if they are also a patient at UC Davis so that we can um, track that. And um, I think that helps the caregivers, you know, burden tremendously when they feel like I am less of a threat to bringing COVID to my family member, not just because yeah. they're vaccinated, but because I too am vaccinated. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we have a question from the audience here about, I, I mentioned the social isolation and someone asked if there's there's caregiver groups where they can get support. So if someone is in a situation where they want to chat with other caregivers, I don't know if across the, the AARP or, or the, the UC Davis network, but, but what would you recommend for a caregiver that's looking for that kind of support group? Maybe we'll start with Susan. 
Well, we do have on that website um, connections. It's not only for caregivers, but if you are looking to talk to someone, there is a, we started a whole way of connecting people. So we have volunteers that will talk to people and we have those that want a volunteer. So that is also on the website. Again, it's not specifically about caregiving though, although we have a lot of family caregivers and there are other things on the website for caregivers to connect. So it's, it's a lot on that website, I realize, but they can connect in that way. And there are social media groups as well. Facebook um, has groups for family caregivers. And, you know, the, the caveat that I would offer is that absolutely um, talking to other caregivers can be a source of support, knowing that you're not alone in the challenges, the concerns you have, the frustrations that you have. It can be helpful to know that you're not a bad person, that it's actually quite common when you're caring for someone to feel all these different emotions. Some caregivers also report that um, they don't want to be exposed to other caregivers' problems because they, they don't know whether or not those are problems they're going to have. I see that particularly in the context of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, where um, somebody who's just starting to deal with uh, a family member's Alzheimer's disease does not often want to talk to somebody who's further down the road there because that can paint a bleak picture that they may not experience. And, and so if you go to a caregiver support group and you don't find it useful, don't give up on that as being an option, but try to find a different support group and see if that actually is a better match for you. Because, you know, just like, um, you know, different neighborhoods have, uh, you know, different, uh, vibe so do different support groups and so don't give up on that as being a source of support if you don't get what you need the first time you go sometimes it takes a couple of times going before you feel comfortable to ask the kind of questions that get you support but also um, getting into the right group where the other caregivers who are there uh, have uh, common experiences that you can learn from, I think it, it is also much more helpful. Yeah, uh, Terry, it's an interesting point you bring up about, you know, not, not wanting to sort of hear too much about what maybe, it, you know, is down the line. We see it a lot in our, we're always running tests on what, how can we deliver the right content to the right caregiver in terms of education? And when it's sort of early, earlier stage, Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, when we use words like brain health and memory changes, you know, uh, we can engage a bit, you know, more and, and no one wants to talk about dementia at that point. They just sort of want to, want to understand what, what they need then. Um, so it's definitely kind of a trend we see in the technology as well. Okay. Uh, let's uh, dig in a bit more for what all of this means for our audience. You know, at many older adults and caregivers are surprised that Medicare doesn't fund the long-term in-home care that is often required. Um, we know that there's some hope in this area, but maybe we can chat a little bit about uh, promising new policies and programs because sometimes the obvious, you know, your Medicare plan isn't, isn't going to be there for you at this time. So what, what is out there? Maybe we can start with you, Terry. Um, you know, I, 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 it's a good thing that uh, Susan will bat and clean up on this question because uh, what I would say is that there aren't a whole lot of services out there hopefully yet, but that um, as we start to see the Biden administration recognizes that family caregivers are important, I'm hopeful that there will be opportunities. There, there are some programs, and, and actually um, one of them is the PACE program that people who are, it used to be just for people who are Medicare and Medicaid eligible, but they've expanded so that um, they now allow um, some private pay, but that provides a, a lot of both in-home and community services for family caregivers um, on an adult daycare model. Again, the pandemic closed a lot of those daycares, but I think we're seeing them start to get ready to open back up. And particularly for working caregivers, um, adult day healthcare services can be helpful so that you um, have a place to 
drop your uh, older family member off uh, during the day while you're working and know that they're going to be cared for. And with PACE, what is, I think, particularly um, innovative about that program is that primary care is provided during that uh, those daycare visits. And so um, it's kind of a one-stop shop. So if you think your family member has a urinary tract infection, you don't keep them home from daycare. You send them to daycare so that they can be evaluated and, and treatment can be started. Um, it, here in California, we have uh, the California Caregiver Resource Centers. Um, they uh, cover large geographic areas, but they have a lot of um, online and some in-home uh, support services that are available for family caregivers. Um, and so I think we're starting to see more community-based models developed. Um, it's not enough to keep up with demand yet, but I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed that we can accelerate and take some of these things, uh, some of these proven resources to scale more quickly. Susan, you probably have uh, more well, optimism to share. Well, those are all very good things. And uh, there is the possibility of tax credits coming down the road. Uh, we've been pushing for that for quite some time. Some states do that, but this would be a federal tax credit for family caregivers. Um, there is in some states that you can get paid as a family caregiver. We did just do a report very recently at the Public Policy Institute. Uh, you can just Google that, ARP Public Policy Institute. Uh, you can find it or I can send it to uh, to you, Jonathan. But it's it's not typical. It's not like, it's, it's actually something that is often asked, can I get paid for doing this? Well, in some states you can. Um, you know, it's something that I think we should be doing. By the way, during the pandemic, many states did ask for permission to do that because the workforce to send somebody to someone's home was just very difficult to do. Uh, workers were afraid to go. Uh, family members were afraid to bring somebody in. And so that became, um, in many states, a possibility. And I'm hoping, and that's what we're pushing, like, look, at didn't that work really well? Let's keep doing that. <laughs> it's a good idea because there's never going to be enough home care workers for the, the need that's coming. Um, so, so I think that's probably the most promising as it goes along. There have been studies of this over the years, New Jersey actually being one of them, that there isn't fraud there's not a lot of fraud going on with this. So, you know, policymakers get worried about that. Uh, and we certainly can't afford to pay the $470 billion of free care. That would be an awful lot. But there should be some that can do this. California has actually been a leader in this for decades, 30, 30 plus years. Uh, they are the number one place that you uh, can find that those kinds of things. And, you know, Jonathan, I think this is a place, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the program, a tipping point that, you know, initially, I think policymakers were reluctant to pay family caregivers or offer um, services for older adults in the community because they were afraid that it would bring people out of the woodwork or displace the caregivers from doing that. And I think what we now understand is, first of all, families really do want to provide this care if they're able to. Um, it's only when the care needs of an older adult or the health of the caregiver prevents them from doing that, that families look to other solutions like placement in some concrete care environment. Families want to do this and if we support them, they are able to do it for a longer period of time and with less cost to their own physical and mental health. And so, you know, I think that um, we're starting to recognize that older adults and their caregivers will do better and they will be able to provide care in the community for longer if we support caregivers. And so, you know, that is changing, I think, the mindset that we have about what is the role of um, the healthcare system, state and federal and, and regional local governments in supporting families so that they can provide the care that they really do want to be involved in? Yeah, no, absolutely. We are uh, we're also big supporters of those programs to support families to provide the care at home, even pre-pandemic 
as Susan mentioned, a massive worker shortage, so you can't find help when you need it. Um, but also that family member who does have either the ability or capacity or bandwidth to be providing care at home, you know, that's the preference and they'll stay at home longer and have better outcomes, you know, for the overall system with that family sort of being supported in that role. You know, one thing, um, can I just add something? Because we haven't yeah. talked about nursing homes and it's, you know, it, wow, the pandemic put such a spotlight on issues in nursing homes that have been there for a while, but definitely the shared rooms, you know, the um, just vulnerability of people in nursing homes and that there should be choices. There should have always been choices that that's not the only option. We are seeing occupancy in nursing homes declining rapidly. It already was. It's been declining probably 20, more than 20 years as more people choose to stay at home and have that option. It's very expensive for states and federal government to pay for nursing home care. Um, it's not covered by Medicare. So you have to pay on your own until you spend down to poverty, basically, and then Medicaid will pick up and then pay with a lot of money for you to stay there. So the more we can prevent that, because the person doesn't want it, the family caregiver doesn't want that, and the state and federal government don't want to keep spending so much money, we have an opportunity now to really say, okay, well, let's make this possible to stay at home and use those dollars more effectively. So I think that's going to um, be helpful, but we have to keep showing the data and, and talking about the consequences, again, using the pandemic lessons that we've learned to help support the idea of what people want anyway, staying at home and having enough support to be able to do that. You know, the caregivers that I see in clinic, probably the um, number one challenge they have is deciding, should I leave this person to stay at home in their home where there are risks and where I'm concerned for their safety, or should I be thinking about placement? And I think, you know, we need to back up um, with family caregivers and, you know, and I hope um, members of this audience who are involved in care or who may become involved in care um, have an opportunity to think about this is that, you know, I think getting a greater understanding of what the older person's um, preferences are and how much risk they would like for the family to take in service to quality of life is really an important series of discussions to have, really. Um, my mother is 89 years old and lives by herself. Um, I have two sisters who um, do a, a lot to help her uh, live by herself, uh, brought her groceries and you know, really um, allowed her to stay isolated during the pandemic. But one of the things that is really important to her to be able to do is her own laundry. And to do her laundry, she's got to go down basement steps. And I've talked to her about this and said, you know, well, you know, the big risk is that you get dizzy sometimes and you could fall down the steps and break your neck and lay there for a while on the cold, you know, cement floor. And she has said very, very clearly, I would rather risk that then give up control of my laundry. Now, I don't like doing my laundry that much that I uh, personally, um, but I realize I probably also don't feel comfortable necessarily asking somebody to do my laundry for me. And I think these are the kinds of conversations that families should start to have so that we understand what what is the reasonable risk to take in service to quality of life and in service to the older person's sense of independence and autonomy. Because what I've found is that you can protect quality of life, you can try and protect them from physical harm, and you can try and protect their autonomy, but you probably can't do all three well at the same time. And so if we can um, engage in these conversations with each other, I've already started these conversations with my daughter so that she knows, you know, what contributes to quality of life and, you know, what are the kinds of things where I say, no, I don't want to live a long time if that is what's going on with me. And by doing that, it helps when we're faced with making those decisions because 
we all have a desire to protect the people we love. And we feel an obligation when we take on caregiving to do that and fear that others will judge us. And yet, um, you know, I think sometimes, first of all, we can't prevent all bad things from happening to older adults that um, none of us are going to get out of this life alive. And when we realize that in some ways it sort of eases the pressure that maybe mom can stay doing her laundry for longer and it's important to her and maybe she'll fall and we will all feel terrible if she falls and, and if it, and if it's a bad fall. Um, and yet the consolation is that she's getting to live a life that is quality for her and on her terms. And, and I think that's important. These are hard discussions to have, but they're easier if we have them before you're faced with that. And so, you know, I could tell my sisters, I've actually been talking to mom about these kinds of things for years. And she has always, you know, been consistent in saying, I want to stay by myself. I want to do what I can do for myself. That's important to me. And so, so I feel more comfortable that although I can't protect her from a fall, I can protect her quality of life for a little bit longer. And I, and I think those are important questions that sometimes um, are difficult to have, but are really, really important to have. Thanks, Terry. That, that was actually a very articulate answer to a question that from the audience that I didn't have a chance to ask, which was, how can families plan for the time when, when a loved one needs care? You know, it's most common to be reactive. Are there proactive approaches that can be planned for? And you really answered that nicely by saying, start those conversations early. It's, um, it's really important. Uh, we're almost out of time here. This has been a very fun and, and interesting chat. And I want to give both both Terry and Susan, a chance to share a final thought. So something you want to leave the audience with. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Susan. Well, uh, you know, I think the most important thing for family caregivers is to take care of themselves. And it's the last thing that they think of doing. Um, really, if you've got to do that. You know, the old put your oxygen on first. But you need to get sleep. You need to eat right. You need to exercise. You really have to do that. Um, and so just find that time um, as much. I mean, you may not be able to take a half hour walk, take a five minute walk, get outside as best you can. That would be my plea to take care of yourself. Yeah, I, I would underscore that. Certainly. I think also be visible as a family caregiver, I think is important because until such time that you are identified as important to this older person's care, you're not going to get the help and support that you need or the information that is important for you to do what you want to do. And so um, if you are helping uh, a family member with bathing, dressing, helping them with meal preparation, running errands, helping with light housekeeping, you're someone that we call a family caregiver. <laughs> And you may have eased into that role and not realize that that's what you're doing. But if you are helping and supporting an older family member to um, get through each day, you probably would qualify as a family caregiver and deserve to be recognized and therefore supported. And so let your primary care provider know you're a caregiver. Let your family members primary care provider know that you are their caregiver. Let the hospital staff know that you are a caregiver. So identify that and then step forward so that we can do a better job of supporting you in that role. Excellent. Um, that's great. That's great final thoughts. And thank you both so much for, uh, for the conversation today. Clearly a ton of great experience, valuable advice uh, on a critical issue for, for the folks watching and um, yeah, th thanks again. Thank you for everyone who, who tuned in um, and the caregivers out there. Thank you for the important work that you're doing. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome back uh, Robert Kilpatrick. Well, that was, as I expected, that was a fascinating conversation about a topic that I didn't know very much about. And I, I'm going to take Susan's advice afterwards and go for a nice long walk. Um, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club of California, I would like to extend uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Terry Harbath from UC Davis, 
uh, Dr. Susan C. Reinhardt from AARP, and Jonathan Davis of Tralta. Um, you know, I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for participating in this, asking questions, and hopefully going out into the world and implementing some of the very important uh, topics and ideas that we learned today. You know, since 1903, the Commonwealth Club of California has been active in organizing programs on topics of interest to our members and the wider community. At the moment, we're organizing over 450 programs a year on a completely digital platform. So I encourage everyone watching this to consider becoming a member for a modest $10 a month, which is tax deductible. Certainly, it was a great investment that I made. We're the oldest and the largest public affairs forum in the United States of America. Look at our website at www.commonwealthclub.org. Look at the spectrum of programs in health, medicine, and anything else you can possibly imagine. I invite you to join with us. Thank you all for a wonderful program, and I hope you have a good day. Bye for now. Bye for now.